am so proud to introduce our final keynote speaker, because Sherry Honkala, like me, was born in poverty. Sherry Honkala was born into poverty in urban poverty, which is, I have come to know, even worse than rural poverty. And let me tell you, rural poverty ain't no picnic. But she was born into rural, urban poverty, and then uh, in an act what I can only call self-help, actually had to run away from an abusive home as a young woman. And I think that that ought to be applauded too. The ability to defend herself and to take action in her own hands, that's, that's actually courage. And then as a young unwed mother, she was living on the streets because she knew she had to keep her family together. That's family values. That's family values when you do whatever it takes to keep your family together. And in an act of brilliance began to organize poor women who had nothing to protect themselves into what became the Kensington Welfare Rights Union, to fight for their own rights, to fight for themselves, to represent themselves. She has gone on to become an iconic figure. And I'll admit the same thing. I'll steal Ben Mansky. I actually knew as an organizer, Sherry Honkala was an iconic figure before I got to know Sherry Honkala, the person. And I'm proud to say that the person actually meets the icon. That doesn't happen very often. Sherry Honkala went on to become a Mother Jones Hellraiser of the Year. Sherry Honkala went on to become a Ms. Magazine's Woman of the Year. Sherry Honkala went on to become a human rights activist that is applauded and lauded all across the world. And what I think is particularly interesting is now doing something that Mayor Soglin did, Tom Hayden did, Ben Mansky did, David Cobb did, many of you did, which is she's preparing to use an election, and follow me here, an election as an arena of struggle. Right? We should think about elections that way. Elections are not just where we're going to try to elect somebody to represent us. We, as committed social change agents, enter into the election process because we see that that is a place where the state legitimizes itself, and we're going to play. We're not going to leave it to the pro professional politicians. So Sherry Honkala, in the middle of a great so-called economic crisis. It's not an economic crisis. There's more money being generated by this economy than the world has ever seen. It's only an allocation crisis. Let's be clear about that, All right? <laughs> Balance the budget, tax the rich, done. Oh, you want more? In the wars. We got, we got a utopia, right? But Sherry Honkala is now running and if you don't know this, I'm going to ask each and every one of you to go home from this conference and blog about, write about what I believe should be the single most exciting electoral campaign in 2011. Because ladies and gentlemen, sisters and brothers, may I say comrades, in November 2011, Sherry Honkala, an iconic fighter for social justice who has used all the tools in the toolbox, is going to be running for sheriff of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Yeah, right? Why sheriff? Why sheriff, you may ask? I'm glad you did. It's because the sheriff in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, serves eviction notices and foreclosures. You know, the, in the midst of the great crisis of evictions and foreclosures, how would you like to vote for a sheriff whose campaign is no evictions, no foreclosures, everybody stays in their home. That candidate is Sherry Honkala. And the last point I'll make is this. If you live in Philadelphia, you can vote for her. But if you don't live in Philadelphia, you can support her. Yes, by money if you can, but more important, by generating the buzz to support her using social media, using social networks, using the internet, using blogs, using Facebook, tweeting on this. We got to go around the corporate media and talk to the ordinary Americans who are looking for a champion like Sherry Honkala. We can all help elect Sherry Honkala, but right now we can welcome her to the democracy convention, Sherry Honkala. You know, when I got a call from Ben and my campaign manager said, Sherry, you've got a speaking engagement coming up. 
I said, where am I going to go? He said, well, you have an invitation. And he said to go to Wisconsin and to be on a panel with Tom Hayden. And so I thought, and I said, well, let me see. I have four boxes of unlawful arrests, over 200 arrests for justice. I'm considered one of the 13 human rights defender, defenders by Frontline to be in most danger doing human rights work right now in the United States. Do I really want to go to Wisconsin? <laughs> You see, I'm trying to stay out of jail, <laughs> at least until after the election. <laughs> and that whole terrorism list, being on a panel with Tom Hayden, <laughs> looks really inviting. <laughs> and after all, being in the room with so many of you great leaders here who are going to start the general strike. Right on. I decided there was no way I could say no, and so <laughs> here I am. You know, I want to thank the organizers of this event. After being an organizer for not as many years as my colleague here, um, I really appreciate all the work that goes into making a conference. But I really believe that this is a historical conference and that these are historical times. And there's a whole new paradigm shift that's taking place. After all, I felt it yesterday in Philadelphia with the, hur with the earthquake. <laughs> you know, everybody was running out of the buildings. They were like, oh my God, an earthquake. I had friends, you know, texting me from California. Now you know how we feel. <laughs> they were really concerned about us. People standing outside their offices, you know, because they were going back and forth a little bit. And, uh, you know, everybody was out there doing their regular prayers. And I was doing mine. God, you know, help me pay rent this month. Help me be able to keep the heat on. Help me have enough money to have some food. As I decide to do something crazy, but like run for political office as a single mother in Philadelphia. Well, I think God is trying to tell us to do something different this year. And it goes something like this. Shut up and stop adjusting to a lower standard of living. Amen. All right. That we have a responsibility, especially those of us, those of you that live here in Wisconsin, we stand on many great shoulders the fight against slavery, the fight that took place here this year in Wisconsin. That silence now is really betrayal, especially now when this year another million families will be thrown out of their homes due to foreclosure at the same time that the banks receive billions of dollars in bailout. And our elected officials are standing there doing nothing. Well, David spoke to some of this, but I am a product of my environment and my history. As a formerly homeless mother, I learned some important lessons coming from the Midwest. Living as a homeless mother in Minnesota, I knew what it was like on that cold winter night when I decided to do something like break the law and to survive, because I had learned about this concept that through the Midwest, they keep these homes on, they keep the heat on in the wintertime 
so that the pipes don't freeze. And I decided that as a poor mother, a homeless mother, who couldn't get into shelter in the Twin Cities, that damn it, I was just as important as those pipes, and so was my son. And I began the process of taking over abandoned government-owned empty homes. And I began the process of getting arrested somewhere up to two, three times on a daily basis. And this was before the time when they had cell phones. So my older son, Mark, he would go down to the corner with quarters in his pocket, put them in the telephone, and call my friends. You see, at the time, I didn't realize that was organization. And then I soon learned that I went from actually being like the homeless mother fighting back who was courageous to now a professional organizer. <laughs> and so the papers, you know, they, the, I, it was fun to watch that shift in the papers as well, right? I went from, you know, the poor homeless mother being denied shelter to horrible radical agitator. And I would learn several of those lessons throughout my life. For over the last 25 years, I've fought hard. I've done things that I've never wanted to do before. Teach people how to build homeless encampments in urban areas, which then began to be known as tent cities, stealing ideas from the Great Depression, creating not these wonderful books here, maybe someday they will be like that, but pamphlets and distributing them throughout the country on how to take over abandoned houses and how to fight foreclosure. <laughs> but through this experience, I never did anything alone. I have been proud to learn the, all of the things that I've learned. Most of that goes to uh, indigenous mothers and fathers that I fought and worked with, African-American women in the South, the books upon books that I read, whether I was at a homeless encampment or in a takeover house. And I also learned from the people around me, the children that will never be talked about unless I talk about them, who at eight years old sat in with me to guarantee housing for other families and were arrested. Nothing you'll ever see on, the C on CNN or the nightly news or anything like that, but the countless numbers of thousands of families across this country that have been participating in a fight to take their country back. One time, you know, the opening of the Constitution Center you know, I have the benefit because I live in Philadelphia, so I've figured out how to use every symbolic historical thing <laughs> to my advantage. You know, I think I'm the only woman, I have to research this, but uh, I think I'm the only woman that did six months daily reporting probation, forget this, obstructing the view of the Liberty Bell. It was like, uh, you know, an O.J. Simpson media experience <laughs> where I had like 80 reporters and um, they were from all over the place. But, you know, I couldn't get housing in Philadelphia for a group of homeless families. And so we decided to, um, you know, bring couches and chairs and lamps and set them up in front of the Liberty Bell. And th the families were going to now live on Independence Hall. And uh, as we were there, you know, we had one of the guys in all of his colonial garb and, uh, you know, his wig on and everything. And he was talking to the children, the homeless children, about how all the fights had taken place to, you know, fight. Our forefathers have fought for this country and everything. And then um, while he was talking, um, the park police on mounted horses started coming our way and uh, 
he realized that the children were no longer listening to what he was saying, so he turned around, and then uh, he saw the mounted horses coming our way, so he hightailed it across Independence Hall <laughs> uh, after talking to the children about how our fathers had... <laughs> So anyway, um, but the Constitution Center, we, you know, we were all so lucky because, you know, they built the Constitution Center and uh, they invited all the past living presidents. And so I knew that it was an important day for me. <laughs> and so we got a U-Haul and not just a U-Haul, several U-Hauls, and we filled them with mattresses. And we painted American uh, flags on one side of the mattresses. And then on the other side, we gave um, the statistic of how many homeless families in Philadelphia. And so, you know, uh, there was only 200 of us, 200 homeless people. We marched to the front of the con uh, Constitution Center. And I bought a ticket because I wanted to make sure I had that in my pocket. Um, because, you know, whenever there's a big event that happens anywhere in the country, I usually miss it. Like, I miss the WTO. I arrived at the WTO, and me and Ward Morehouse went to jail um, before the whole thing got started. I missed all the fun. Um, we just arrived, and we went to jail. But um, So I was always prepared um, to perhaps miss out on any big event, because I usually went to jail before the event happened. So um, as we're walking down the street with the mattresses, and I'm carrying one end of the mattress, um, we got to the front of the Constitution Center, and we were there, and we said, you know, we're here to amend the Constitution. And um, they didn't think it was funny. <laughs> and, you know, again, we had media from all over the place. And the next thing I knew, I found myself in jail with my colleague, Galen Tyler. Um, and the officers came to the jail cell and they said, Sherry, you really screwed up this time. Um, but the police officer is hurt really bad upstairs. And uh, you're being charged with seven felonies for aggravated assault on a police officer. And uh, so then I began the first in a series of arrest for aggravated assault in my life. I was facing 22 years in prison. And um, thank God for independent media, because I don't go any place without them anymore. But while we were in the courtroom, you know, one ranking officer after another took the stand. It was like, you know, a reunion for law enforcement that day in my courtroom. And they each took the stand and they all perjured themselves. And then um, my lawyer, it was that, you know, glove moment. Um, <laughs> did you get it? Okay. So he pulls into his briefcase and he pulls out um, the video of the entire day's incident where I'm carrying a mattress. And, uh, you know, the officers begin to look at each other and freak out because uh, they have to find somebody that's responsible for this. So some poor officer uh, ended up being the fall guy in the situation, and uh, he lost his job on the force. Um, but I tell you that story um, because then I figured, wow, I'm going to be like famous. Everybody's going to know how horrible the Philadelphia police are. And so, you know, a week later, we distributed it to every single media outlet in Philadelphia. We were like, whoa, we got them. I'm going to have a massive lawsuit. I'll be able to feed and house everybody across America. <laughs> and then the press conference, uh, we called a press conference, and the next thing I knew, I got a call from the mayor on the phone. And the mayor says to me, um, Sherry, I think you should really call off the press conference. And I said, no, we're not going to call off the press conference. We're going forward with this press conference. And so we see all this press coming and that kind of stuff. And the next thing I know, something's happening in the mayor's office, and all of our press leave. <laughs> all of our press leave. So anyway, so the moral of the story is, is um, I have to tell you these stories 
because uh, separate of independent media and the people that participated in them, you would never know about them. And these are important stories to tell because now we're living in a time where we're dealing with billions of dollars that are being used to preempt our civil liberties and to teach us that somehow there's terrorism, terrorists out there when we're really dealing with the terrorists here at home. So, you know, this is all really about, like, you know, how do you overcome and master fear? That's what I've come to learn. And I've especially learned it during our great democratic democracy experiences in this country. You know that thing, elections? That's another joke, okay? <laughs> um, I learned it during the Democratic National Convention when, you know, we had a poverty march and, you know, all of a sudden I had to explain to kids why they were shooting rubber bullets at us and why uh, Ted Hayes was on his way in the ambulance. And then I saw it again in my hometown um, during the, Republican, the last Republican National Convention in Minneapolis, um, in which I got a call from the Justice Department in Chicago before the, the march. I mean, how dangerous could it be? I have like a history of organizing very large marches for like the last 10 years during conventions and we're always peaceful and nothing ever happens. I got a good track record, but the Justice Department called me from Chicago and said, you know, Sherry, you can't go forward with this march because we're afraid for your life and then we're afraid for the life of some of the others that are on your march. And in particular, when you get in front of the Capitol and you get in front of the St. Paul jail, we can't really guarantee your safety. And I said, what? And then I realized that I needed to turn around and tell them in front of media again that, damn it, you better guarantee my safety. <laughs> because uh, if, you knew, if you have some prior intelligence that says that something's going to happen to somebody, you better do your job. And needless to say, everybody, at least hopefully in the Midwest, because the rest of the country never knew about it, the most horrendous kind of violence happened. The, you know, the Fox News was embedded with the police. The uh, arresting of 80 reporters. You know, so when we talk about building this kind of movement for a new kind of society, we can't just talk about our side. <laughs> there is another side, and they're organized, and they're dangerous. And so we have to remember that throughout history, people have always had to encounter this question. How do I move forward? How do I not become immobilized by fear? Well, I got to tell you the truth. After that whole experience, and, you know, I was still speaking the same kind of rhetoric, but I actually freaked out for a couple weeks. And I wanted to retreat because the power of the state is a very brutal thing. And they can actually just make you disappear, be a paragraph on the back of a page after working your whole life. But I decided that to live a life immobilized by fear isn't really living. And I deserve to live, and so do millions and millions of poor and homeless people desperate to speak out across this country. You know, I can ask children in any high school, at any elementary school, to talk about any issue, any hard issue, whether it's race or gender or whatever, and they'll talk about those issues. But if you ask them, are you poor, even if they all live in the same housing project, even if their mother is losing their home, or even if their address is a car, they will not tell you because they're more ashamed of that. Even though down the block, their neighbor is in foreclosure, and then the one on the next block's in foreclosure, and then their other friend is in foreclosure. 
There's 14 million unemployed, 43 million below poverty, 50 million uninsured, and 3.5 million homeless. This last year, my sister lost her home after 20 years. My friend dying of AIDS, I told and pleaded with Judge Fox not to go forward with his injectment because to throw him out of his home right now would potentially kill him. The judge and the bank went forward. My campaign office right now in Philadelphia is located next to the largest disability organization in the country. They just laid off 180 disabled workers who will probably never work again in their life. We have the second highest hunger rate in America now in Philadelphia. And people are groveling to, to figure out how to feed people. In Philadelphia, we spent more money on prisons than education. And across this country, we continue to spend more money on war. So this year, I had to make that decision. I had to have my own earth shift by deciding to run for Philly, in Philly as the people's sheriff. Somebody that will protect the people, not the banks, the developers, the speculators, the greedy bastards. <laughs> that if our politicians don't have the backbone to step forward and keep families in their homes, that if the banks will refuse to take the money that they got and modify the loans, well then, damn it, I will refuse to throw any person in Philadelphia out of their homes. Well, of course, they're saying, well, Sherry, that's against the law. <laughs> and, you know, they've really been worried about being lawful with me. <laughs> and do I have a problem with that? Are you really serious? Is this just rhetorical? Are you just trying to uh, get your issues out? No, damn it, I'm trying to keep people in their homes. And that's what we intend to do in Philadelphia. We intend to make history. And you guys can be in on it or not. I need your help in a small place. Well, Philly's not that small. But in a big place, in a historical place in Philadelphia, we as people across this entire country can really make history. If you figure out how to take your four or five dollars, write your friends, learn how to get on Facebook, I had to. <laughs> you know, hold a house party, a dance-a-thon, do whatever. We can send a message across this country that we are morally opposed to in the year 2011 to throwing men, women, and children out on the streets. Are you with me? Yeah. But this isn't just about bad, greedy banks or corrupt politicians. We need a whole new cooperative society. One that's based around human needs. One that says that we should be in charge of the banks. That we should have a community controlled land trust. That we should build public housing instead of tear it down. That we should support our teachers and public, and public education. 
and that we should create living wage jobs. For God's sake, there's plenty of jobs to go around. It's 2011. It's time to stop all the barbaric behavior. You guys have demonstrated that here in Wisconsin when you stood up. We have a collective moral, yes, moral responsibility. I refuse to proceed from this notion of scarcity. Damn it, there's enough to go around and we just need to start sharing. It's time to stop drafting abstract principles. The fight for real democracy is in this room, in this fight. I need each and every one of you. Again, become my friend, come to Philly, hold a house party, do whatever you possibly can. King said it best when he said, there are millions of poor people in this country who have very little or even nothing to lose. If they can be helped to take action together, they will do so with a freedom and a power that will be a new and unsettling force in our complacent life. We are that new unsettling force. We are one class. We have one cause. Let's play our role in history. Thank you. Sherry Honkala, everyone. <laughs>